I'm going to start the uh, uh, presentation here with a short little movie. Yes. There we go. Anybody know who, what this movie is? The Graduate. Yeah. Prof Professor Young, Ramirez, and myself know this movie. Y'all, it's probably a little, little old for you, but it's a, very important for students and graduate students to perhaps see this movie. It's Mr. McGuire. I'm going to stop it for a minute. So he's just finished college and he's coming back I think to the west coast and he's got a girlfriend out who's at Berkeley and uh, you know uh, he's getting asked by they're having a party for his graduating he's getting asked what he wants to do with his life. Uh, does ever, anybody know what the Mr. McGuire is going to say is is the the thing that he should do what he should get into. It's any I, I, plastics. Plastics. He says to get into pla well. That's what you think he says. I just want to make sure you. It's a, it's a little. This is this is a little different. I don't think you've actually seen this version of the movie. <laughs> And of course, I had to ruin it by uh, stopping. Corrosion. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that was, uh, that's actually, uh, Dustin Hoffman's playing me and uh, my professor Jack Breen is playing uh, Mr. McGuire. So that was what I was told my future ought to, would be or ought to be is uh, in the field of corrosion and pretty much uh, I could say that's been largely true. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of different types of projects and things but certainly one of the central themes of my career has been in the uh, repair area. So we're spending, uh, this is uh, uh, probably 11 years old back in 2020, 20 billion dollars a year spending on repair of uh, just concrete, not uh, necessarily other materials. And you know things uh, with repair, there are th reasons to repair things. Some are needed just because there's actual distress in the structure. Uh, things aren't built right, things are deteriorating, you need to remediate material de uh, deterioration. Uh, uh, such as uh, corrosion. In this case, this is actually a fairly uh, uh, active uh, case of alkali silica reactivity. And so, one, and one of the things we're being asked more and more to do in the industry is to extend the service life of these, these structures. Although we have a great infrastructure system built uh, largely after World War II in the 50s and 60s, it's now uh, 50 years old, 60 years old, in some cases approaching 70 years. Sometimes we're, uh, we're involved where the uh, structure is just not performing well. This happens to be a dormitory uh, at the University of Oregon. Uh, it was going to be, it's called the Global, Global Scholars uh, Hall, uh, their premier flagship dormitory. Uh, and it ended up having, it was a two-way uh, concrete uh, slab structure, reinforced concrete, it ended up having up to four inches of deflections in the dormitory rooms. So that's, a, that's not a, it wasn't going to fall, but that's a bad serviceability problem as you can imagine walking into, uh, uh, into a room that has four inches of deflection. And sometimes uh, there are construction defects uh, that are, uh, that are uh, happen in, in the field and uh, we need to remediate those. So. Uh, a uh, number of different things. Also, uh, a, as I mentioned, a lot of older structures were trying to get expanded use, trying to repurpose uh, those uh, uh, structures. This happens to be a, a facility in Nashville, Tennessee that uh, we're working on, just started on, and they're taking a, a meat packing plant and turning it into condos. 
uh, don't ask me, but uh, you know, apparently that's uh, uh, something that uh, a developer saw a good eye for. It's in a very good location within Nashville, and so we're working on lots of corrosion problems in this facility, both of reinforced concrete and structural steel. Um, the repair industry, I think, by and large, I've lived through it, has been kind of known as the, the, the Wild West. Uh, you, you could see a lot of different repairs over the years, that, and certainly I have, that uh, don't really work uh, work that well. You have uh, uh, the uh, uh, you have uh, uh, the good where you get a structure that's completely rehabilitated, and this is uh, one of the my projects that I'm going to profile in my presentation today. The the one in Salem, Oregon. Uh, you get the bad where you've got people go in and try to just do. Uh, small repairs by uh, slapping up some material on them. Uh, you get here where you have repairs done and you got repairs next to repairs and then the repairs crack and so on goes the cycle where it never it never ends and so a lot of repairs don't uh, don't particularly look good. Uh, now we have a, a, a great new uh, code uh, it's uh, been this is actually the third version uh, the ACI 562, uh, we call it the repair code, but it's the code requirements for assessment, repair, and rehabilitation of existing structures, and it lays out, uh, and it's going to, it's been evolving over the last uh, two cycles, but this 2019 version is, goes a long way to helping the industry understand what we need to do uh, in, in repair. Uh, the aim of that document is to uh, really promote uh, reliable repairs so that you know when you get the repairs done that uh, they're going to work. Uh, it's uh, to limit the variations in repair performance. Uh, when we do a repair, we want to make sure it's performing well everywhere that you're implementing the repair. Uh, it establishes some minimum practice, uh, just like you have in building codes or minimum requirements, and then provides refer reference points for building officials. Building officials always tend to be a little uh, concerned when you're doing a repair or strengthening project because they always want to point to a, some something in a document, some provision in a document. So 562 provides that. So here, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but here's kind of the outline of 562. And the main, you have some upfront general criteria. And then the main parts of the document of the code are assessment and evaluation, repair design, and construction and quality assurance. And I'm going to present these two projects in the context of using this, we used the 562 code for uh, those repairs. So uh, one, two, and uh, three that I mentioned uh, is uh, what we're uh, striving for out of that 562 document. Under assessment and evaluation, we need to determine what is the probable uh, cause of the, uh, uh, the problem, define the loads and the anticipated uh, exposure that it's going to have over its remaining service life, uh, de define the extent uh, of, the, of the problem. Sometimes it's not everywhere, it's only in limited areas, and define the, the uh, extent of the required repairs. Under design, we need to select a repair methodology that makes sense for uh, this, whatever the, uh, uh, the cause of the distress is, uh, the material selection to ensure compatibility, and then durability considerations. We want to make sure that the repair, in fact, lasts. And then finally, under construction and quality assurance, we want to make sure uh, the repairs are uh, executed uh, properly. To a, we want to address any temporary conditions and we'll show, I'll show a few of those in my presentation on these projects. And then uh, very uh, important inspection testing requirements. The only way we're going to know that we have a good repairs is to fact have testing and inspection. So with that kind of as background about about repair. I'm going to talk about these two projects uh, in the United States that we uh, uh, we worked on. Uh, in case one, I, we call the game of miles and inches. And I think you'll uh, understand it here in just a few minutes what I mean by that. It's the Austonian, uh, which Professor Ramirez uh, uh, mentioned. It is the second tallest building uh, in west of the Mississippi, residential tower west of the uh, Mississippi. Uh, it was the tallest until last year. Uh, where's the tallest one? In Austin, Texas. And it beat this one by one and a half feet, 18 inches. So, of course, everybody wants to have the tallest building in any city. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's called the, it's a Jenga style building that has the boxes that look uh, in, uh, it's not the Providence, but some other, uh, other building. But this is the Austonian. It's a, uh, 
uh, uh, very nice looking structure, all residential. Our two senators in the United States Senate uh, actually have uh, homes uh, in this uh, tower. Uh, on the bottom is a 10-story podium slab uh, in which uh, uh, you know, it's parking and some down on the bottom is retail and other space. Uh, tenth floor is the swimming pool and some other amenities for the, uh, for the project. Uh, one of the things I wanted to make note about this project is, you know, Austin is not on the coast. It's about uh, 150 miles from the uh, nearest ocean, so we're not in a very harsh environment. Of course, we get rain. Uh, a little bit of maybe a little bit of snow, uh, very fairly rarely every couple couple of years. Uh, we certainly get some cold fronts, but uh, uh, it can be some humid some days. But normally it's fairly dry and uh, you know uh, uh, fairly hot in the summer, but not uh, not uh, not a lot of uh, humidity necessarily. It's a uh, what's called a, a banded post tension design. It's a flat uh, flat plate. Uh, and then there are tendons running in both uh, direction in the uh, what is the east-west direction or top to bottom is what we call the banded tendons. They're grouped together much like a beam would be grouped. Uh, and then in the other direction is what we call the uniform tendons. Uh, they in essence are picking up the load and delivering the uh, kind of the load to the beam which is uh, the in this case the banded tendon. So it's a two-way banded post-tension system. Uh, so it's uh, concrete, all the other elements, the columns, the shear walls uh, are all reinforced uh, concrete. On this uh, uh, structure there are a number of uh, uh, elements, both uh, functional and architectural. We have, uh, you can see some balconies, each of the units has uh, an exposed balcony, some larger than others. And then you see in the red, kind of in the, in the middle there, what we uh, it's really an architectural feature. They extended the slab out into uh, the uh, uh, area. It's really for architectural purposes, uh, but uh, we called them eye eyebrows for lack of having another term. So arch uh, architectural uh, eyebrows. So if we measure all of those exposed concrete slab surfaces, uh, you know, some of them are enclosed within the glass and window uh, systems, but all of those areas end up being 1.75 miles of exposed slab edges. So uh, that's, that's where we're getting the game of inch, miles and inches, and you'll understand what the inches mean here uh, shortly. Uh, so here's what the underside of a deck uh, uh, balcony looks like uh, and any of the, uh, revula uh, any of the other uh, eyebrows. Uh, there is actually a drip edge uh, where uh, it's formed. It, that's actually a kind of an architectural feature as the rain comes over and drips down along the bottom instead of having go across the entire bottom. They put in a drip edge there that will interrupt the uh, flow of the water and just drip down uh, below it. So it's, uh, it's uh, often done in any kind of exposed, uh, uh, exposed concrete uh, slab. So six years after completion, this was built in 2010. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is an area where a 65 pound piece of concrete fell 150 feet down to the 10th floor. I mentioned that 10th floor terrace. Uh, it landed about five feet from one of the uh, uh, workers for the Austonian. Happens to be on the area that is the dog park for the facility. They have a dog park on the 10th floor so all the residences can go down and they can walk their dogs without going down to the street and they walk it up on this terrace level. So this piece of concrete fell and it kind of created some concerns and uh, that's when we got uh, got involved. And um, I'm not going to take you through, it ended up uh, you know, uh, being litigation related. They got some money and then we were the repair uh, engineers of, uh, of record. I'm going to spend my time talking about the more fun stuff which is actually repairing the structure and how we approach this problem. And I, again, I'm going to do it in the context of these of this 562 building code. So let's look at assessment and evaluation. Well initially we did a hundred percent visual assessment. We had to get up there, walk out on the balconies, we used binoculars from balconies to look at the e side edges because we we were concerned that you know there might be other areas of, of, uh, that were a problem. So, uh, and then we also did, uh, did a forensic evaluation to understand what was the cause, why is this uh, happening in such a short period of time. So, uh, as we went up, 
this is the 37th floor, you would see things like this, where you have a crack along the, uh, the slab edge. And remember, this is post-tension. So you know, we're also dealing with the concern about if you've got cracking along here, uh, is it impacting the, uh, the integrity of the post-tensioning? And that's something that we, uh, since that's what holds up all the floor slabs, we had to be very judicious in that. Here's another area uh, where you can see pretty pretty near where some kind of about ready to spall off on the uh, underside of that uh, of that slab and uh, we found just through that quick visual assessment 31 locations that we uh, we thought were an emergency condition we put on temporary uh, protective covers over each of those to make sure that no other piece of concrete would dislodge and fall down uh, and potentially uh, hurt someone. And so, and when you look at those kind of the red dots, uh, this is the west face and that's the east face. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to, you, you might say there's a little bit of variability, uh, but uh, pretty much for its eastern you're seeing incidents of, of this happening and whether it's from bottom to top you see some incidents of that happening. So it seemed like, at least from a first pass, that uh, this is probably a systemic issue but we needed to find that out. Uh, so we go into our forensic investigation. We have to uh, very judiciously go out and using swing stage, uh, uh, get out on the uh, deck, start doing our thing, doing some uh, non-destructive uh, testing. We do some uh, e evaluation and some verification using uh, uh, a, a drill in order to measure the uh, cover of the reinforcing steel. We were able to do most of it non-destructive either through either through GPR or an, an, an impedance uh, cover. Uh, if you look uh, at the, the literature and assume that this problem is is a uh, it could be either a yes or no but it could be anywhere then the statistics would say that out of all that 1.75 miles of slab edge we probably need to look at about 15 percent of it in order to have 90 percent confidence in what our findings are going to be, so uh, it's a little bit more, a little bit more math and statistics involved in that. But that's a that was a good number for us to uh, uh, to go with uh, uh, based on the uh, running some statistics on on this. So uh, we have the top of the uh, slab, the slab edge. We have this edge reinforcing bar, which we'll get get to, and then this drip edge, and that ends up being that bar there ends up being the uh, problematic uh, bar, because as you saw in the area where some of that concrete came off, it was right next to that uh, drip edge or right next down to the bottom cover. And it, as we went out there and started investigating where that bar was located, we found it was moving all over the place. It had clearly not been secured. It had not been, uh, we were wondering, well, it was it even supposed to be there? And uh, going back in the drawings, we found out it, there was a, a, a change order, not a change order, a RFI from the contractor, uh, which is a request for information saying, we normally build these things with a bar along the slab, and the engineer came back and said, yes, there should be a bar down there, but that's all the information they gave. So here we are back to the uh, bar. You can see in this case, not even on up in the concrete, it's right along the base of the uh, edge of the slab. And so through our study, this you know, rather rigorous 15%, we, said, we found out 86% of the slab edges did not meet code requirements for concrete cover. And when we say that, what do, what do we mean? So normally exposed concrete would need an inch and a half of cover. Uh, there is a provision in the 318 building code that says if you provide other means for protection, you can reduce that in half. Other means of protection might be putting a waterproof coating over the concrete. That would suffice in order to be able to reduce. And they did, uh, in fact, uh, have a waterproof uh, coating that was specified. What we found out was it was generally not present. Uh, and sometimes it was just on the top edge, sometimes it was on the top and the side edge, but didn't go up underneath. The actual drawing showed that it was supposed to go across the deck, down the side, and about six inches past the uh, drip edge. Uh, that almost was never found on this, on this building. So uh, if you do that, it could be three quarters of an inch, so keep that in mind. 
And then, uh, of course, when we build concrete, we don't build it with precision. Uh, there are tolerances that we have to live with. Those tolerances are, in fact, a quarter of an inch on cover. So you could get by with a half inch of cover on this structure if there was other protection uh, of the steel. So, you know, I started off showing we're 150 miles from the beach. You know, there's no chlorides. Most of us, I tend, I've spent a lot of my uh, career looking at chloride-induced corrosion from chemical de-icers, from uh, marine exposure, a lot of different exposure. So what kind of corrosion was this? Anybody have any ideas? Concrete, well, concrete's normally a very good protector of reinforcing steel from corrosion. This was, in fact, carbonation. And normally we think of carbonation-induced corrosion being something that we never have to worry about because we, in industrial areas or concrete that's very heavily exposed, uh, the carbonation front will, may take 50 years to move through there. But when you have a bar right on the surface, I mean virtually a quarter inch of cover, a sixteenth of an inch cover, it doesn't take long for carbonation to occur and to cr create a corrosion cell. So this was actually carbonation induced uh, corrosion. So repair design, we have that reinforcing bar with inadequate uh, cover and what are we going to do about that? Well, uh, we heard all kinds of things and we, I can tell you at the end of a uh, during the litigation stage, people were saying, oh, just go in there and put some FRP sheets over the edge of it, you'll be fine. Well, that's, uh, in, in my uh, uh, profession in repair, that's a no-no. You don't put, you don't hide corrosion issues. You gotta address the corrosion issues. You can't go in and put something that's just basically going to be a catcher uh, for any corrosion. You gotta deal with the corrosion issue, then you can do other, other things. So, the only way to really deal with it is to take out the offending bar so that means removing that concrete uh, from the exterior and when we're doing that of course we've got to uh, uh, worry about the post tension anchorages that are right near that end so it can be you know it's a, it can be a dangerous business but we've done it enough times uh, there are safety precautions that can be taken to make sure that we don't have any uh, unintended uh, effects of the PT. So our repair was then to get rid of that bar if it would, did not have the right amount of cover. In some cases, we left it in place if it had at least a half inch of cover. We then used an inert uh, uh, GFRP bar, which is non-metallic, glass fiber reinforced uh, polymer or plastic uh, bar, uh, which we had have manufactured into these uh, uh, with 180 degree ends. And we had some additional longitudinal bar bars, scaling bars uh, that went along the edge and then we added this, uh, instead of this being the profile here, uh, we added uh, two inches of additional uh, concrete and then got, or, of course, re removed this uh, drip edge, made a new, uh, new drip edge. So uh, basically it was to get, get rid of the metallic uh, substance that was creating the problem. Then we did what the original drawing said you were supposed to do that was never properly done to prove, uh, provide a waterproof coating over the top surface, down the side, across the, uh, w the intersection between the, this concrete and the uh, new concrete, repair concrete, and the old concrete. So let's take a look. Here's uh, the chipping uh, that was done. You can see uh, some of the anchorages uh, in here. Uh, again, you got to be very careful, but you know the contractor uh, that was uh, uh, contracted to do is very skilled in, in working around uh, post tensioning. Uh, uh, you look at the reinforcing steel. If the bars were, could have an inch and a, or at least a half inch cover, they would remain in place. If they didn't, uh, they were cut out and, and, and replaced. Uh, these are the types of things that we would see. Uh, you know, here's the. Uh, uh, some uh, concrete that's about ready to fall off and then you see the the bar with no cover with uh, corrosion uh, on the side. Uh, so knock all that off, uh, put on the GFRP dowel bars and the GFRP uh, uh, detailing steel, uh, form it up. In addition to, it had to be designed for, uh, basically you have to design for a rail load uh, for, uh, on the balconies to take a certain shear and we're doing that by shear friction across that plane with the GFRP bar. 
uh, you have to rely on the manufacturer who has done, we re, that we required them to run, run test on shear friction with the uh, GFRP to make sure we had enough capacity. And then we also use some, you see these little items in here, sometimes the uh, PT was so close together that was very difficult to get a GFRP dowel in there. We use stainless steel helical pins uh, down uh, in there as well, and of course stainless steel is for the most inert to uh, uh, that type of uh, corrosion. So GFRP bar, stainless steel. And then once we uh, removed the uh, concrete, we had uh, uh, always when you have new concrete to old concrete, you're going to get a tendency to have, get very small shrinkage cracks. It's just inevitable. And we had provision to fill those with uh, methyl methacrylate before they came back and uh, put the waterproof coating on. And you also see uh, a Point right at the intersection there that we knew that that would be a an area where we would tend to want to uh, crack and of course the waterproof coating is going to come over there so that provides kind of an elastic uh, area there for the membrane to be able to, to bridge. Uh, just to prove that I actually did something on this project, uh, this, uh, you know, they, they had to take a picture of me up, uh, up in the sky. I can't say that I was a whole lot, but uh, I did make an appearance uh, on this project. Uh, so uh, the load transfer considerations, I mentioned uh, shear friction uh, through the uh, anchorages, a couple other things that we did. Uh, we also added a uh, corrosion inhibitor to the concrete uh, uh, mix. We increased that width. As I uh, mentioned before, we have that sealant joint up there and then everything else is really inert. So really trying to protect from an ongoing performance point of view what, it's, what the uh, durability is going to be for the uh, uh, future service life. And then construction and quality assurance, uh, again, it's very important repair. Uh, like any new project, when you design something, it's only good as, as it's implemented. You can have the best design if it's not implemented correctly. It's not, you know, things aren't going to work. Well, you have to be, it's probably doubly the case in, in repairs. So, you know, we got, uh, you know, these exposed PT anchors, which was a concern to us. How long were they going to be exposed while we're, before we pour the, uh, cast the con new concrete back? Uh, you know, although Austin is not near the, uh, the ocean, it does get rain and thunderstorms quite often. So we were concerned about uh, getting dry, uh, dri water driven into, uh, from rain into these uh, PT. And in fact, you can see in a very short time, you'll see some almost flash rust, uh, 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 ferrous oxides that develop. That, that's that orange uh, uh, color. Uh, it's not, it's not a, a, to an aggressive point yet, but we were concerned about what do we do at the end? Uh, there were some protective ends that we, uh, we just had a performance requirement. The contractor worked on a n number of different types of things, made a mock-up to try to demonstrate the adequacy uh, of the protection that they would have over the end. Uh, you know, had a power washer there, ran it through. You can see some water droplets coming, uh, coming through with this method. So they went through a number of trial and error to figure out what would be the best uh, protection methods. And they finally came up one that we were comfortable with that they had to put on within, uh, I believe it was within uh, three, three days of the exposure. And then it had to be left on until uh, no more than three days before they cast the concrete. So and some of these were exposed for couple months. You know, they, they went through and did a lot of demolition work first to get all the debris off and then they, and they closed, them, uh, closed them up. So uh, what, what did we do? The elements of a QA, QC or concrete removal needed to inspect then. Reinforcement and form work you need to inspect then. Concrete placement you need to inspect then. Coating installation you need to inspect. So there's really four stages of, of inspection that needed to be uh, done on this uh, repair. And we, we had a log, we produced that for each location and uh, the inspector, uh, the owner uh, retained an independent inspector, had to go through, fill out in each case that the, the observations were made, what the report number was, and then they'd have a written report that was filed and logged into the, uh, into the system uh, that uh, uh, would show that he had uh, signed off on each of those four, four phases. Uh, in, 
uh, we're not uh, com com compressive strength and slump. You know, every, we always do in concrete. And the good thing about those is it always provides some element of what the consistency of the concrete is. It gives us some information about that. For this purpose, you know, compressive strength doesn't matter a whole lot. Nor does the slump, other than placing it. But it provides a measure or a metric for knowing that each time the con uh, contractor is mixing up concrete, that you have some uniformity. Uh, worried about shrinkage, we had some pretty strict shrink shrinkage requirements uh, for a 28 test. Pull bond strength, that's the measure of, you know, what's the strength at that interface between the uh, new uh, concrete uh, uh, and the old concrete. And then obviously we didn't want to be adding chloride, so due diligence would say uh, make sure we don't have any added chloride to it. And then modulus of elasticity, again, isn't a big one, but we wanted one of the things that you learn in concrete repair uh, is that you want the you really want the new concrete to be very compatible mechanically to the existing concrete. You don't want to have this super high concrete with a high modulus next to something that's just your basic 4,000 psi average uh, modulus of elasticity. So uh, we d ran some modulus test just to confirm that we didn't have some, you know, super high strength uh, concrete. So we uh, did frequent tests on the top two just for quality. We did less frequent test on pull bond strength, and I'll show you some of those, and then very infrequent test uh, really at the beginning of, uh, of the repair project on the uh, last two. So bond is critical at that bond line between the two. And the way uh, we measure bond is using these uh, disks. Uh, the inspector would go up and tell the contractor, I'm going to run, he ne you never knew, he says, block out this area, this is where I'm going to do some pull bonds. And then they block that out, and the con you can see the concrete uh, reason we didn't pull concrete all the way to the edge is when you do a pull bond test, it's, uh, it's very, <clears throat> very easy to get some uh, unintended eccentricity that tends to uh, put a little bit of bending in the, in the uh, uh, surface, and so you don't get an accurate, real good accurate determination of the pure pull bond strength. So you want to make that as short as uh, possible. In your core, after you do, do, do the pull bond test, uh, you can see here the pull bond test has been done. Uh, typically in an application like this, it's going to fail probably at the, at the bond line. Uh, sometimes you, it might fail in the, uh, uh, e the existing substrate. Sometimes it fails in repair concrete. Where it fails is reported as part of the uh, test. We had a uh, minimum requirement of 120 PSI. Uh, you know, a lot of people say it needs to be 175 or 200, but the problem with pull bond tests is there's a lot of variability in the test. We find out that if we can get, uh, you know, 120 PSI uh, uh, test on uh, average, we're doing good. We had, did 145 different pull bond tests over time. Uh, we had an average of 215. You can see the standard deviation of 85 PSI shows it's quite large. But we had some of these, you can see here, what do you do with those? Well, we do a little bit of investigation to see if we could figure out was it the testing, was it something else? And uh, in most cases, when that happen happened, we'd go up there. You can see here uh, an edge of the uh, new concrete, repair concrete, and then you look up along that edge, you can see really not good consolidation uh, across that surface. It was poorly consolidated. You didn't get a good marrying of the new concrete with the old concrete. Uh, we've got poor bond strength, so what did they do? Rip it out. Do it again. Uh, after a couple times, a contractor learns, uh, learns his and her le lesson very quickly. So it's why it's very important on the inspection QC that it be done right. And then after that, uh, we, I think we probably had, after the first, first month or two, we had three occurrences or four occurrences of this, and after that we had only one more for uh, as m the rest of the months. So. Uh, that's the uh, uh, that's the and that's the uh, the game of uh, inches and miles that we had to deal with. Uh, although uh, you know, in terms of uh, kind of principles, it wasn't overly complicated. Uh, you know, you can imagine the concern that the homeowners had about falling concrete, that the city of Austin had about falling concrete uh, on potentially onto some of these streets too. Their sidewalk, public sidewalks down below. Uh, so we were able to get that uh, uh, building uh, completed. Uh, it was completed uh, this last uh, June. Uh, it took uh, 16 months of construction uh, work uh, to do it. We got involved 
probably it was 2016 we probably got involved in 2016 originally um, and the cost of construction was somewhere around 10 million dollars for the repair <coughs> okay number two uh, I call the dangerous building and in fact it was quite dangerous this is the uh, uh, complex in Salem, Oregon. Uh, it was owned jointly by Marion County, which is the county. Salem happens to be the capital of, uh, of Oregon. Uh, this is called the Courthouse Square Project. It's uh, mainly the administrative offices for Marion County. And then it was also a bus uh, a transit hub for uh, the uh, what's called the um, uh, Kaiser uh, bus system and so part of the facility was all the various offices that it takes to run a, a county government uh, this transit uh, area and then one uh, one area that was for future uh, uh, planning so uh, one of the things we uh, had to deal with is here's the courthouse square it's just you can see that red area that whole big block of area uh, in the what we found out very early on, it, it's not a good thing to have the local newspaper across the street. <laughs> that creates a lot of issues and so we had uh, this this generated a lot of public uh, uh, outcry about what was going on and what was going to happen to the to the structure. So just a little bit about the the, the structure itself, there's the uh, uh, the building, it's a uh, story building. Uh, the intermediate area there is the transit air, uh, system and then the, uh, this area here is for future potential uh, development. Uh, one of the things we found out, they were all post-tension. Uh, the, uh, the, the oddity was there, like for the transit system, they used bonded PT uh, for in the areas of the banded lines, but for the transverse uh, 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 tendons they use unbonded PT. Can't tell you why to this day I can't tell you why. Uh, this was all both unbonded uh, post tensioning uh, building was also uh, that ended up b uh, being a, a uh, completely bonded post tensioning system. So you had different post tensioning systems in one building different ones in the, uh, in the same building and again it was a little it's a little uh, unclear why that was uh, uh, that was done. Uh, this is uh, down in the bottom deck uh, below, you can see there's some pretty skinny looking columns. Don't quite look right, at least not to me, looking at the uh, kind of the aspect ratio. Uh, you can imagine if you're a supervisor for the county and you know this is your parking space that you're driving into and you see all these cracks and uh, water coming out uh, and, a little, and fresh water coming out over at the edge, you get a little concerned. Uh, you see cracks in the, in the, in the pie laster and uh, you see uh, you go inside and over time this thing had been thoroughly looked at by a lot of different people but you see cracks in the shear walls and like you know there hadn't been any earthquakes there hadn't been any big winds why do I have things that really look like they're structural cracks uh, you know it's a little 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 odd well we'll uh, we'll take a little look at that uh, this was uh, this is some of the uh, uh, issues that came out because of all the post tensioning that were in these systems uh, the system the windows began to rack and uh, they would allow water in and in some cases we were actually able to go and put a piece of paper along the bottom here and get to the outside the, gla the glass had completely separated from the frame and the sealant joint so they were getting water leaks all over this building uh, because of, uh, of, of, of issues and so uh, this was 10 years after completion you know, they got, uh, they had people, various consultants study this, and 10 years after completion, they're going, what are we going to do? Well, uh, here's some thing. The building has long been plagued by structural problems. Uh, Marion County offices and other tenants will vacate the courthouse within 90 days. So they had a evacuate order from the city building official after 10 years saying it's unsafe, you got to move everybody out. They, they had to move there were 37 agencies in this building that had to be moved out the rest of Salem. There wasn't enough, there was no, everybody moved all over the place. I mean, you'd have one agency going here, another little agency department going here, because there wasn't enough uh, space available uh, there. So uh, this was a, ended up being a big deal. Uh, and, uh, you know, then you get in, you know, after the fact, people ask me, what well, do you think it needed to be vacated? And I said it was probably the prudent thing to do. 
uh, given what we we found out about the the structural issues and we'll go through some of those uh, this is how people viewed the building uh, you know <laughs> they're going like this building's moving it's like rubber it's moving all over the place we've got windows that are uh, moving uh, you know it's it's worse than you can think Ilum adds courthouse square to dangerous buildings list so anything you could uh, the citizenry and then they had to uh, close off that uh, transit area so they had to move all the bus traffic to the outside of this this complex onto the street and that created uh, all kinds of traffic problems and flow problems for the area down in the central uh, business district i'm not going to go through the litany of a uh, uh, long list of defects, some that were identified by uh, the consultants that were originally back uh, uh, back in the day that the uh, authorities had hired, and then uh, and then we found them additional ones. But you can see you have punching shear, flexural, uh, low strength concrete on one of the floors of the building, uh, uh, flexural of the of the slabs, column strength. There was some issue about the foundations, whether they were undersized, and so. The office building, Transit Mall, and North Block uh, all had various types of defects that had to be uh, dealt with. And so we had to go through and look at what, which defects were real, which ones, what elements needed to be fixed, which elements didn't need to be fixed, and, and go from uh, there. What we didn't find out in the RFP, the RFP had all these things uh, that were listed as potentials that they had found out from their consultant. What wasn't included is like sensitive owners. You know, when you build this thing, suddenly you, get, you know we get in there and it's like everybody's hypersensitive about everything. And understandably, they had to close their building. You had a determined building department. After all, they had under their responsibility built this building that had all the problem. They did have a new uh, uh, building official at the time we started. You had what we called an angry peer reviewer. Well. Uh, we went into RFP. Nowhere in the RFP did it ever say that our repair design was going to be peer reviewed. And then suddenly we're submitting the drawings and go, oh, you need to submit all this stuff for peer review. Well, that's a big problem. That takes a lot of, a lot of time and effort. So, you know, we ended up getting paid for it, but uh, we didn't know. Uh, a challenging owner's representative. Uh, and then we had all kinds of stories about the original uh, structural engineer. So back to this 562 process. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through these. We did a forensic evaluation, some materials testing, an analysis. You can kind of look at the uh, 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 grouping of types of NDT and uh, openings that we did at a lot of different locations. We had to get, so the way we, went, we ended up doing this as a repair design, repair build project. So we teamed up with a contractor, we had to compete with other groups, and then won the contract. But when you win the contract, and it was a guaranteed maximum price, uh, you got to know enough about the building to make sure you're comfortable with what the fix is going to be and how much it's going to cost. So it's a different, it's a different game than I had been used to. That was my first foray into a repair design, repair build project. So we uh, looked at you know whether the concrete was uh, was was good. We looked at the PT to understand if there were any uh, corrosion issues that we needed to be aware of. Uh, some uh, other consultants had done some load test on areas to demonstrate that yeah, that perhaps by calculation there are some punching shear issues but it may not be as bad as you think uh, measured some tension in in in, in the tendons uh, we did some materials testing to get an idea of the strength of the of the concrete uh, did a bunch of structural analysis even when we put in our proposal we had to do enough to know about the design and this is where we discovered what what ended up being the the big problem with the structure it was poorly designed and it was poorly designed only the only reason it had not been a, a problem for collapsing slabs or whatever, it was over post tensioned. This had a, a P over A compressive, average compressive stress of almost 800 psi, which for a building is unheard of. I mean, typically it's 150 to 225, 250. And, you know, uh, the story is the, you know, the engineer who originally designed this. Uh, you know, had never done a PT building. That was the first problem. The second one is the, the poor guy passed away while this was under construction. And so this other younger guy who was a PE had to take over responsibility. But 
you can imagine those cracks in the shear walls were all from restrained shrinkage. All those racking of those window systems and the glass and the water leakage were all through because over time the structure just kept moving due to the sustained compressive stress. In that you know you get a lot of creep, particularly when under high axial uh, loads. That that was really a, a big design issue. The deficiencies, though, things like some punching shear issues did exist. Uh, this is an area where we opened up the. Uh, the deck on the transit mall and you could see kind of evidence of what looks like uh, kind of cir circular uh, cracks uh, uh, due to punching shear that you might anticipate so certainly that made it gave us pause. Uh, some of the columns again were quite small and uh, really did not have enough flexural capacity uh, combined with the uh, axial load. Uh, this is what the deck looked like when we first got out there to the transit mall. Why in the world would you use pavers? on a, a deck uh, in Salem, Oregon. So they put that on a structural concrete deck with underlain by membrane, but water gets up underneath through the, uh, through the joints in that, uh, those uh, pavers and it ex freezes and expands and it just keeps moving. And it just kept, you know, in 10 years, you couldn't even hardly drive a bus on that thing after a while. And it, moreover, it's non-structural, it adds nothing but dead load to the uh, facility. Uh, we had up to four and an eighth inches of deflection in the building that we had to uh, deal with. So what do we do, repair design? Well, we added uh, basically a sh what I would refer to as a shear lug, wherever we had punching shear. Uh, we didn't, uh, in order to be able to develop a steel for like a drop panel, we weren't able to do it. So we did that by uh, adding steel along the side of the col column and developing the shear through shear friction. Uh, which you can see it made, it, it made the drop a little bit deeper, but we had plenty of room because of a drop, a drop ceiling. So plenty of room to do that. You can see some of the details that we had to utilize for the strengthening on columns. Uh, the columns were uh, really gravity designed, but the, this was a seismic design category D. So, uh, which is a you know, high seismic uh, area as you might anticipate, and then the, you have to have your gravity elements, so have to be able to go along for the ride in a lateral ev uh, event like from an earthquake. And so the ACI building code requires those, those columns, that even though they're gravity loaded, to have certain detailing requirements to make sure they can move along with uh, the other parts of the system. Well, this was completely inadequate. So uh, we weren't going to be able to go in and add the kind of the detailing requirement. What we came up with, we added for strength. You can see some bar longitudinal steel uh, that we had to splice through right here, but then we wrapped all of it in FRP. And so through the performance of looking at FRP that completely surrounds concrete, it really matches very well kind of the what you would expect if you had good detailing requirements for a column. So most of the, all the columns had some form of FRP. A lot of the columns ended up having additional concrete added. Uh, for the deck, uh, the structural, uh, for the transit mall deck, we added a reinforced concrete slab. Uh, that was great because that helped with some of the punching shear uh, issues. It, it was not really adding all that much more dead load uh, than the pavers. Uh, one of the things I like to find after we g got rid of all those pavers, the contractor goes, what in the heck are we going to do with all these pavers? So he decided to have a free, free, free for pavers for all on a Saturday. And after that day, you go walk around, you drive around Salem, Oregon, you saw more planting beds and landscape with pavers along, ed edging along their uh, plantings than you would ever imagine. There were, you know, thousands and thousands of pavers. But uh, the one thing that we, uh, remember this was post-tension, steel, but in order to get composite action between the structural deck and this, we wanted to act compositely. We had to have shear transfer. We, had to, we did that through uh, dowels. But we had to put all those dowels in into a PT system. So we had to map out extremely carefully using radar where all the PT was uh, located. We did a very good job. There are literally, uh, I think, something like 5,000 tendons in this deck. We ended up hitting three and uh, breaking three. The code allows you 
2% loss of, of tendons, so we didn't, didn't replace them, didn't do anything. So it, it worked out uh, very well. So that's what the deck looks like today after we did the structural deck and put, put in good drainage uh, uh, system in the right slope. So we put on a multiple layer epoxy overlay, which is very, very rugged, uh, particularly for bus traffic. It, it's, a, it's a very durable uh, uh, system. It's, it was uh, used, it's been used a lot in Virginia to uh, re rehabilitate their bridge deck. Uh, of existing uh, structures. Uh, this is how we basically had to infill with uh, uh, a uh, non-structural material where there are bad deflections. And uh, a little bit about construction and quality assurance. Again, following the theme that we did with the previous building, uh, we, we had each area that we were fixing, we had uh, whatever was done at the, if it was dowel installation or pre-pour inspection, then everybody had to either the sign off uh, on that given given area. And so we tagged each of those in the in the building, kept very uh, good records that then went into a construction database. You know, normal sort of uh, things: pull bond test, uh, uh, slump test. Uh, after the uh, we had to repair a lot of the joints and sealants in the windows. They did uh, water testing uh, uh, that was done by another 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 group and so uh, that's kind of the hard side I didn't go into a lot of the analyses that we had to do but you know some of the things that you you know we weren't we should have been aware of but we weren't but the kind I say the soft side of concrete repairs uh, so I, you know we think of this as being very scientific uh, put, we're putting it back together we're strengthening it and of course you get the owners looking at it psychologically going can I trust this building even after I get done it's like well yeah, that's a good question. You know, we say yes, but who are we? We're we're just another engineer, just like the engineer who designed it originally. So you have to instill trust uh, with the owners. Uh, here's something that appeared. Everybody know what GWF means? Everybody knows what that means. Okay. So you'd see it's time once again to revisit the crumbling major square in the heart of downtown. Uh, you know, here's the original uh, people saying this thing is. Uh, uh, bad, it needs to be taken down. You need to just take this building down. And uh, I'll give the credit to a couple homeowners, uh, citizen advocates in Salem that said, we think that's a waste of money. They weren't engineers and they went out and started looking around, could we in fact save this, save this building? And ultimately, that's what ended up how this project came about. It's through some citizens' actions going, we don't want to waste any more uh, money tearing this down. They still owed money. They had borrowed from the Federal Highway to do the transit system. So they were going to tear it down and still owe money on the building that was being torn down. So one of the things you really had to do, and we realized very early on, we, we needed to get the trust of everybody, the stakeholders, uh, you know, the building officials, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the various a you know, people, agencies, the various uh, super uh, supervisors of the, uh, of the government and so forth. We did, you know, we'd come in, show them what we were doing, the type of fixes that we were doing, uh, uh, bring them in, even got the fire department, let them use the building as a repelling uh, wall in order to practice some of their uh, emergency uh, evacuation uh, skills and you know over time over this was another project that lasted about 17 months uh, you began to see the tide turn the public opinion turn about you know whether this building in fact was going to be safe so we knew we we knew we had won the battle when we knew that the biggest problem was what when carpeting was the biggest battle we had to deal with everything else became easy except for the carpeting. This was the, this was the specifications for the carpeting that had to be complied with. You know, uh, more difficult than actually the, uh, the, the repair concrete that we needed to deal with. We completed the project uh, uh, in 17 months, uh, on schedule, on time, on budget. Uh, uh, it was a big, big su success uh, to everybody. Uh, that's the uh, uh, project at uh, uh, completion. I wish I could take credit for the photograph, but I can't. Uh, but again, uh, you know, this is a story. Uh, it ended up costing $25 million for all these repairs. Uh, it was going to cost $59 million to tear the building down and to uh, build another building. And a lot of people think that that was probably too small. They weren't sure. But 59 million, we did the repairs for 25 uh, uh, million. And uh, I've had a chance to go back and visit the site a couple times since uh, we finished. And uh, happy to report that um, 
everything's working very well. One of the unattended effects when we put that structural uh, composite slab on the transit mall was everybody in the building says it's a lot quieter than it used to be. The transit buses used to come on there. There was a lot of, uh, probably from those uh, pavers making noise and because it was a thin slab there was probably a lot of vibrations that were getting carried, carried into the building. But now we have a much stiffer system, structurally composite, and they said that really has turned down the noise level uh, with, the, with the buses. So uh, with that, I just, uh, I'm happy to uh, take any questions and uh, appreciate your attendance. Thank you for coming. Uh, is there a combination for the uh, drip patch? Is there a comment here? No. Uh, so, I mean, normally this would, e this would even be an afterthought. Normally, so that business about that bar being down there is, is, is really, a, I have seen that bar in slab edges like that, but there's really no reason for that bar to be there other than someone wanting a bar there. It doesn't do anything structurally. The bar at the top where you have a hook or a bar going back in, that's a different story. You have to develop the bar. That bar is it, it, people do it because it's, it, they just think it's an edge, let's put a detailing bar there, maybe it will control some shrinkage cracks. So I've seen it both ways, but that drip edge uh, was way too close uh, to, the, to the edge. And that bar, uh, because of the amount of PT that it had in it and the other reinforcement it had in it, I know what happened. I mean, this, start, this was down at the very bottom. The contractor, or the steel uh, fabricator, when they were putting the uh, uh, reinforcing steel uh, in there, they had no place to put it or tie it. And they just they just threw it into the form. That's basically what ended up happening is they just threw it wherever they could get it and it ended up being all over the place. So uh, we would normally not have carbonation induced corrosion of reinforcement. If we had, if you had the proper amount of concrete, it would never, it, carbonation would have not uh, occurred. Yeah, you're welcome. Yep, line in the structure that one of the big design problems was that it was, it was over close tension? Yes, yes. How did your repairs mitigate that? Um, well, <laughs> that's a good question. They didn't, we really didn't mitigate it. We had to, we had to, all our fixes had to work around it. Really what's happened after, after 10 years of service, all the movement of those slabs had occurred. There was not going to be any more creep. And so there were a lot of cracks in the masonry. I didn't talk about the masonry uh, curtain wall system. And so we got asked, well, you know, are we still going to have problems with this? Is no, the, the compression's in there. Just live, live with it. We had, to, we had to do, and in fact, there were some cases where it helped us a little bit because of the punching shear uh, issue. Uh, but uh, we just we basically had a fix fix around it. We had talked very briefly, but not very long, about actually cutting some of the post tensioning, and that lasted about 10 minutes. I said we're not cutting anything that's good in the structure, even though it's not properly designed. You would never have that much post tensioning in it. Let's just fix everything else around it. So that's that's what we did. Mark. That Bostonian building. Yes. The, um waterproofing protective mm -hmm. system that was supposed to be there yep. but apparently wasn't. Mm -hmm. Was that a sealant? Was that a membrane? What was that? Well, so it started off being an elastomeric membrane, truly a membrane originally. And then through our favorite term that we have in the industry, value engineering, they decided, okay, we'll just have it on the top because that's where you know the patio area or balcony areas are, and then they called for a a uh, a watertight paint on the side, and but not even wrapping that around. And then on the ceiling, it was just regular. I mean Sherwin Williams paint, basically. So all that was changed, and what we found out, I didn't show you. I mean, we found edges that didn't even have paint on them. I mean, we saw ceilings that didn't have paint on them. We saw everything in between. So the system though was supposed to be an elastomeric waterproof membrane that went around all the edge and that's ultimately what we ended up providing. That would in fact, uh, had they had done that, they might have eventually had some corrosion issues but not in, not in the six years. Yeah. It, it would have probably mitigated the carbonation if it had been there. We have several uh, here that 
are taking pre-stressed concrete, mm -hmm. and we haven't gotten to unbonded yes. tension construction, but they've seen already pre-tension at mm -hmm. least enough that they know more or less what the role of pre-stress is right. and how do you proportion yep. uh, the number of uh, mm -hmm. strands and the level of pre-stressing, mm -hmm. whether it's strength or service load right. criteria, right? So my question is, in that slab where you said they got 800 PSI, mm -hmm average compressive mm -hmm. stress, how did they get into that game uh, when typically, because of yeah. the thin slab, you wouldn't want to get more than 150 or you're going to get in trouble just like you described. Yeah, I, 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 I can't answer that. I, we, to this day, we don't know. I mean, uh, th we, uh, you know, you can imagine after this uh, what happened. I mean, the, the, the remnants of that engineering firm had been sued and paid out and whatever you d we didn't have any any they had no records from it I, to this day I mean I'm, I'm horrified to think about an 800 psi pre-compression in a slab mm -hmm. and uh, I'm surprised that it didn't have you know with the eccentricities that you didn't have mm -hmm. some cracking on the on on air but w we couldn't see everything uh, because of for example in the uh, transit mall because of all those pavers and whatever after all those were moved we did find some fairly big evidence of flexural cracks on some of these punching shear cracks I, I don't I, I really just don't know what they what they they did Julio I, I just don't have a good understanding of it because if I may have yep. more yep. of course yep. how would you how would you have approached the design of that slab for that application where you I think they were supporting vehicles too, right? Yes, yeah, so I mean th it would be no, uh, it'd be a little bit heavier loads than obviously you would have on a typical parking deck, right? Because you've got a bus load is uh, say more in line with what you might have in a, in a, in a bridge, but the, uh, that loading is nowhere near creating the level of stress at the bottom fiber or top fiber of the concrete that you would need to put that much PT necessarily uh, in and so you know I, I typically what I do to design or look at very quickly the design of a of a PT is I I typically design for strength without looking at stresses working st allowable stresses I design for strength you're eight out of ten times you're going to be right on with the amount of P PT when you then go back and check uh, working, you know, service load stresses. Occasionally, it's going to be a little light. You may end up needing to have a little more PT in order to counteract some, you know, depending on your geometry, uh, the stresses. But if they would have done that in this case, they would have found out you needed a lot less, lot less PT just from those calculations. I mean, that's how we knew immediately without actually. Well, we looked at the P over A, but we looked at the strength calculation. This thing was way, way over designed for flexure. But it had a lot of other, you know, the shear problems and, and things like that. So, you. yeah, you're welcome. Well, please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Postman yep. again for Thank you. Time.